We'll explain it to you when you're older. This is On The Verge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome to On The Verge, uh, brought to you by Samsung. I'm your host, Joshua Topolsky, and you are a human being, and that's okay. I'm not gonna judge you. Uh, we have a really big, exciting show today. Uh, we have an interview with the US National Security Editor of The Guardian, Spencer Ackerman. We're gonna talk about PRISM with him. Uh, Koi Vin is going to be talking to us about iOS 7. Uh, he is, of course, the former uh, design director of The New York Times, so he's got a lot to say about design and Apple's design challenges. Uh, Nilay Patel, who I know you love, did a wonderful piece on PRISM and what it means for you and your loved ones. And our intrepid reporter, Nathan Seikert, took to the streets of New York City to ask people if they actually care about their privacy and things like PRISM. Uh, also, this week, Kanye West said that he was the new Steve Jobs, which is extremely important to know. So obviously, a lot going on, a lot to talk about. Let's talk about this week's biggest tech story. The big story is, of course, if you've been following technology, Apple's WWDC, Worldwide Developers Conference, which they hold every year in San Francisco. Uh, it's a big deal for them. They had a bunch of announcements this year, including new MacBook Airs, uh, iTunes Radio, uh, a new OS X called Mavericks, which is a beach, uh, which sounds lovely. I've never been to a beach, but I would very much like to visit one at some point. Uh, and they also announced this new Mac Pro, uh, which looks nothing like any other computer on the market or that has ever existed, pretty much. I think it kind of looks like a Braun KF20 coffee maker, but uh, you're gonna have to draw your own conclusions on this. Uh, of course, the biggest story from WWDC is iOS 7, the new version of Apple's wildly popular mobile operating system. And a lot of people have been pretty critical of it, people like me. Uh, I wrote an angry editorial about uh, the design of iOS 7, which I think is, is somewhat lacking. And there have been a lot of designers who've come out of the woodwork to talk about their issues with the new design of the OS. Jason Santa Maria, for instance, he tweeted, multitasking, tabs, control center, airdrop, and general interactions are looking fantastic in iOS 7, but wow, the ugly stick. Tom Coates said, iOS 7 will probably be really awesome when they do the visual design. And Koi Vin, who we're going to be speaking to very shortly, said, if iOS 7 is revenge on Forstall, Forstall's revenge may be that it's kind of not that great, which is a uh, disgusting, nasty, sick burn all over uh, the good people of Apple. Uh, my advice would be to get some aloe and just rub it all over your body because you've been burned very badly. Uh, anyhow, but I will say this, the, the event uh, was very much a typical Apple, big Apple event, though some of the language they used and some of their tone seemed to be a little more humble and a little more reserved uh, when talking about their products. Take a look at this. We are incredibly, 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 incredibly proud. The results are really incredible. Incredible, 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 incredible. It's just incredible. Incredible, incredible. It's really incredible. Incredible. The incredible, 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 incredible. Now this is incredible, but but maybe not surprising. Really powerful, powerful power. Power tags. Beautiful, 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 beautiful documents. Gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. 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 Beautiful. 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 Just beautiful. Beautiful documents. The data is just gorgeous. 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 It's just gorgeous. And as you can see, it's a beautiful pages document. Perfectly smooth, incredibly fast, super fast, super fast, super glassy, super smooth, super clean, and super nice, super cool. It's just epic. I'm gonna go a little over the top. Can't innovate anymore, my ass. Just like that, it's really just amazing. It's just fantastic. It's pretty awesome. Phenomenal. Fantastic. 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 Sorry about that. I got a little excited there. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. Radical. It even sounds cool. It even sounds cool. It's not even close. It's not even close. A stunning. 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 The amazing. It's unbelievable. 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 Profound. Pretty great, 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 great. So great, 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 great. Those words mean a great deal to us. And I hope they mean a lot to you as well. And joining me now to discuss the look and the feel of iOS 7 is famed designer, Koi Vin. Koi, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So look, you've been fairly publicly outspoken about 
you seem like you don't, you're unhappy that I'm bringing this <laughs> up. You don't want me to talk about it. You shouldn't have been speaking publicly then. No, you've, right. been, you've been publicly outspoken about iOS 7. Uh, is, it, is it bad? Is it bad design? That's, by the way, a very loaded question. Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag. I think, on the whole, there's a lot of good stuff there. There's a lot more stuff that, surprisingly, for Apple, doesn't work as well as it should, even in a first release. What are the things that you see? And obviously, we've both seen the keynote and some of the stuff that's on the site. Um, it's, it's in beta right now as a dev beta, so this is not, to some degree, it's not final. But mm -hmm. what is it that you've seen that isn't, that isn't working, the stuff that's su the surprising stuff? I think they've just veered so far into this area of trying to create a minimalist interface that a lot of really simple things like buttons or you know, menus have, that have, they've totally reinvented just look like they'll be problematic once real people get their hands on it. Right. People who are used to a very different yes. interface. Right. Non-technical people, people like yeah. right. the proverbial moms out there. Like what? What do you attribute this to? I mean, it's unusual for Apple. I mean, we know they've done some, they've had some weird design missteps, yeah. right? That, I mean, what, part of this feels like a reaction to the skeuomorphic debate, the felt and the wood, and they made a lot of jokes about that. I mean, do you feel like some of the missteps are due to this being a reaction? I think they really wanted to make a break after, what's it been now, about six or seven years of the iPhone. I think they wanted to really push things forward into a whole new direction and um, create you know, a new chapter for iOS. Um, so I think most of the, the motivation is, is great. Um, I think they've hit choppier waters than they expected to. Uh, trying to make you know such a dramatic change. Looking at the design, I mean, we know that Johnny Ive was put in charge of of interface design. Is there stuff here that's kind of mistakes that a guy who's not a software uh, designer w would make? Does it feel like some of this is is his newness to that world? Well, I mean, I hesitate to say it's because he's new to software design, but. To me, it does feel like there's a lot of those kinds of mistakes that people who are coming into software design for the first time will make. I mean, there's, a, there's an overemphasis on the graphical quality and probably not as much emphasis on the, the behavioral quality of the interface. Right. What's your take on the icons? I like the simplicity. I, I wish they were stronger. Overall, it, they, they seem like a first pass to me, right. and I, I'd like to see them revised again. Okay, so what are you seeing that is working from, from what they've showed off in, in iOS? Well, it's a beautiful interface. Uh, it, it really has a lot of, of great visual things to recommend it. Uh, the, the transparency, the, the, the thinness of, of all the elements, it just sort of feels very lightweight. And I think that's something they really try to, to bring home is this idea that the interface itself doesn't have to feel heavy anymore. It's, it's like the devices are getting lighter, the interfaces are getting lighter. Right. So I think it's, it's done that job. I, I, think, um, I think where they thought you know, that they might have been 90% you know, of the way there, they might be only be like 70 or 80% of the way there in terms of really making everything work. Right. So you said on the, on the typography in uh, the interface, uh, in the case of both Apple and Google, their uses of Helvetica Noi are so prominent that they're almost indiscriminate. And as a result, both of these efforts skirt that thin line between aspiration and desperation. Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate a little sure, bit on, yeah. on what, what you're thinking is behind a, a statement like that? So Helvetica Noi, which they're using very prominently, and I also mentioned Google has been using that really prominently in their um, iOS apps. That's a really beautiful typeface that traditionally or historically has been used in the fashion and beauty industries. And it's meant to connote modernity, sophistication, and, and thinness, frankly, right. um, for... Like actual know, thinness. Actual Because it is actual physically thinness. an extremely thin font. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I don't think that it's, there's any accident that these companies have chosen this typeface and, and really put the t this typeface to the fore. Um, they want people to, to think of their devices as fashionable, as, as a, a really you know, desirable complement to the way you think about your own personal presentation. Um, and I think that's terrific. But if you, if you really look at the way Helvetica Noi is, is used in print design and magazines and publications, it's used as a, um, you know, what we say is a, a display typeface, meaning it's meant for bigger, 
um, bigger uses of type headlines right. and titles and so forth. And both Google and Apple um, have used it uh, not just for display, but for text labels and for you know paragraphs and at smaller sizes where where the letter forms start to run together a little bit and become harder to read than you would like. And yeah, I mean a, lo a lot of those apps are sorry not to interrupt, but sure. a lot of the apps on, on, on that that they show images of, they're, own, they're it's all text. I mean it really yeah. is, and it's yeah. all sort of the same font weight, right? In varying sizes, right? And it does it does seem a little bit daunting um, for the eye. I mean. You know, it feels like a little bit of Helvetica Noir goes a long way, yeah. and a lot of it. Right. It's like sort of. It's one of those more is more. You know. It's, yeah. Um, you know, but it feels like that's a fundamental part of the new iOS. That 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 typeface is going to be that widespread. Yeah, I think I think they can still pull that off by using it at the larger sizes in in the display text um, situations. But um, but at the smaller sizes, I don't think there's anything wrong with using a heavier weight of Helvetica. And, and I hope they consider that, because it's going to improve legibility dramatically for people, uh, especially for people who have, you know, like some eyesight challenges. Right. Are, are you, so there's a story going around now that there is some, the, the Apple's marketing department, mm. some of the designers there somehow had a hand in designing some of this interface. Does that does that sound like it makes sense? I mean, you're a designer, you've worked in design for years and years and years. You've yeah. obviously worked on some very big projects. Uh, is this the kind of thing where you would go, you would reach out to, to a marketing department and say, to me this seems like a crazy concept, especially for a design-driven company like Apple, that you would go, hey, let's farm out some of the icon work to the guys in marketing. Does this sound like a situation that could be, that sounds real to you, realistic? I don't, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility. I mean, I have no firsthand knowledge. I have no idea what happened at Apple. But I think the idea that you want to you want to bring in different voices into the design process. You want to bring in folks who who are coming at design problems from from a different background, from marketing, from from print, from packaging design. I think we're going to see only more and more of that in software going forward. I mean, software design um, until fairly recently has been a Pretty homogenous kind of uh, a field where everybody like lives and breathes software, and they don't bring tons of external influences into it. So the idea of bringing in marketing folks is not inherently bad. It's right. just how you manage that process of, right. of mixing together the different ideas. So what if you're at Apple right now? They they're like, come 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 and be fix our design. Yeah. What are what are the where are the first things that you're what are the first things you're attacking? How are you attacking them? It's a very broad question. Yeah, very I'd broad very question. curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't fundamentally change the look of iOS seven. I think I think they have good reasons for going in the direction that they're going. Um, I would focus more on the lower level interactions and making sure buttons look like buttons, making sure there's consistent behavior with toggles and switches and the way you know, uh, action sheets reveal and and the way you know sharing works. All of those things. Um, I think there could be a lot more work to, to make it more intuitive and perhaps more consistent with what's come before. Um, and I would fix some of the lower level typography as well. I would keep the, the bigger picture Helvetica noise stuff, um, but make sure text labels and paragraphs and smaller text are, are a lot more legible. So what would you do? What font would you go with? I would go with a different weight of Helvetica, Helvetica Noi. Would, would you just, just make do it, like, a, like a standard you know, a, a regular, regular. Or, a, or medium or, or in, in some cases a bold, yeah. Do you think you'll have an opportunity to go to Apple and fix <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Probably not after that tweet. <laughs> no, right. Yeah. The tweet is maybe it was aggressive, you know, maybe. Uh, yeah. Do you feel your reaction has been strong? Um, I, I had a few people pipe in and say, yes, I agree, or no, you're totally wrong. I, I don't think the, the tweet was uh, particularly, you know, um, uh, you know, unique or controversial. That, you know, I, I don't think tons of people said, whoa, I can't believe he said that. Right. So. And, and do, you, do you think that... And this is, th I guess this is kind of uh, the ultimate question. This is a beta, whatever we saw is a beta. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it'll change in any fundamental way from a design standpoint from, from uh, now until the fall when they uh, presumably will release new devices and, and put this on their old devices? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to, to speak about this stuff in terms of numbers, but it might change 10, 15%, 20%, and right. that might be enough, I, I think. I, I think it will look more or less the same when it comes out, and I think that's fine, but I, I do, I would guess, based on the level of furor that we've heard, that they will make some changes this yeah. week. Yeah.
Coy, thanks so much. Really thanks appreciate a lot. it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, stick around because next we have a helpful explainer for your new best friend, Prism, and we'll be right back. You are being watched, recorded, spied on. It all sounds like the ravings of a conspiracy theorist, but those theories gained a lot of steam this week when the Washington Post and the Guardian published reports claiming that the US government is collecting mountains of data on every citizen. They can look at your emails, your photos, your private Facebook profile. They can watch your Google searches in real time, they claimed. Last night, a single tear rolled down the cheek of a government employee when you used your Xbox to order Pizza Hut. But is any of this really happening? It all started when Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian broke the news that the National Security Agency had ordered Verizon to hand over records on all calls originating in the United States. Now, it should be noted that this does not include the content of the calls, but rather the associated metadata, the IMEI numbers of the cell phones, the time and duration of the calls, the two phone numbers involved. But still, that metadata is powerful and telling. That story is quickly followed by the revelation of another government program called PRISM, which collects much, much more. As reported by both The Guardian and The Washington Post, PRISM collects data from technology companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple. The exact scope of PRISM is still unclear, as the original report claiming the NSA had, quote, direct access to the company's server has been partially retracted, and the companies involved and the NSA have denied the majority of the claims. Google's first denial was basically titled, What the f***? There's always a chance, though, that it's happening without the companies knowing. And according to the Washington Post, the NSA may have direct access to the company's servers without their knowledge or consent. Google, for example, contends that it delivers data only after a specific court order and does so via secure FTP transfer or literally by hand. The company, along with Microsoft and Facebook, has asked for more openness and transparency. So as Congress, although it should be noted that President Obama has claimed every congressperson has been briefed on the PRISM program and has voted several times to keep it running. The White House has defended its surveillance, and others say this is simply business as usual for the Bush and Obama administrations. But the documents have made explicit what many have feared, that laws like the FISA Amendments Act and the Patriot Act have allowed the U.S. government to run roughshod over citizens' privacy. At this point, what we need is more transparency from all sides. The Guardian and Post need to show us the rest of the evidence they have regarding the government spying, and the government itself needs to be clear and honest about what kind of data it collects. The only problem is that none of these parties will feel any pressure to do anything unless the people actually care. How do you feel about the government spying on you? The NSA? <laughs> There's no point of doing it to everyone. It's just going too far. Um, it's invading my privacy um, without even my consent. So it's just a viola viol violation of my Fourth Amendment. See, I, I, I tend to have a different opinion. Um, if there's a way that we can stop you know, a terrorist attack from happening, I think maybe it's something that should be used, but there's, there needs to be some kind of constraint towards it. It's the same thing as airport security. Do I want them to pat me down and put me through a machine every time? No. Do I want them to make sure no one else has a bomb on them? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. You feel like now they're getting uncomfortably close. They have pot the potential to be, but um, I definitely think if it's anything on the internet, then that is fair game. I mean, you posted it with the intention of people seeing it, so I think that that would be fair. Are you okay with your searches being sent? Uh, no. I mean, I have nothing to hide, but... What about it's like Friday night, it's like 2 in the morning, you're on Google, and we all know what, what we're searching at 2 in the morning, but... I mean, I I mean, I'm a man. I mean, I don't care. Absolutely, yeah. It's not, it doesn't bother me, but I feel like it's my privacy. Why should you know what I'm doing privately? What if you had access to government technology where you could check in on like an ex of yours? Someone says it's totally legal, they won't find out. Would you use that information to check in on your ex? I mean, I would to um, track people down and figure out where their location is. Their specific location at that yeah. moment? What if it wasn't legal? But this, this guy pulled you aside and he was like, listen, I work for the government, Don't, no one will find out, you can use this information, would you do it, uh, even though you knew it was against the law, would you still check in on these people? Um, I'm gonna say, yeah, I would still do, because, you know, as I said, people should be safe around this community. Every move we make, they're watching us. The song is more true now than ever. All right, y'all, give it up for Mike McGavin, New York.
Do the people trust the government? Do people trust the government? Very, very helpful and also frightening stuff from Neelai. And joining me now via Skype is The Guardian's U.S. National Security Editor, Spencer Ackerman. Spencer, thank you, first off, for joining us. I know you're extremely busy right now. Uh, let's talk about PRISM and what we know right now. There's been some confusion, it seems like, in particularly in mainstream, a lot of mainstream press about uh, the this story and, and whether the take on PRISM that we've heard so far, that there is some collusion between these tech companies and the NSA is accurate. Uh, you, do you feel that the, uh, the story has been accurate thus far, right? I mean, this is, there is some collusion happening, is that right? So there's a program that we know is called PRISM that basically monitors the online communications of a vast, vast amount of people as long as the NSA has some kind of suspicion. We're not really sure of what the standards are, but it has to have it like a 51% suspicion that the people they're monitoring are outside the United States or are not United States persons. So that's what PRISM is, and there are uh, something like nine companies involved. There are nine companies involved. Microsoft, Google, uh, Facebook is involved. Um, the extent of their involvement, they're now negotiating with the Justice Department to disclose. But the NSA has been working with them. They want to add Dropbox to it. So the communications that they believe are outside the United States are harvestable under this program. Right. And so you said 51% confidence that, that, this, that the person they're targeting or the people they're targeting are outside the U.S. Do you know how they build that confidence? I mean, is this just a whim of somebody at the NSA? I have no idea. The NSA has not disclosed that. That's a fascinating question. That would be a really excellent subject for a public hearing. <laughs> so there's been a lot of talk about this this direct access debate versus a lockbox versus you know the companies have basically uh, uh, denied that there is a direct any kind of direct relationship. Can you explain a little bit about your understanding or, or, or how this is working? That these companies seem to be not dancing around; they're flat out denials. They say we haven't heard about Prism. So how would this work, or how does it appear to be working in a technical manner? We're waiting to hear the specifics about how. All this gets ironed out with the companies. Um, the companies are right now, because they're worried about their business, asking the Justice Department to disclose what they can about uh, requests for information they get from the government. There's uh, lines from, from the slide deck that we have that suggest the companies can go in themselves. Uh, so we're really uh, waiting to hear what the Justice Department will let the companies say about their cooperation. The, the slides are, seem very direct in what we've seen at least so far about how they uh, describe uh, the access to data. Does it, does it seem to you that, there is, that these companies are, could be more involved and that there's a reason why they're not able to speak on that? Um, yeah, for years, through the Patriot Act, through an expansion in 2008 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, recipients of these government requests for information from telecommunications companies, from internet service providers, and so on, have been under very serious restrictions about what they can say publicly. Recipients of administrative subpoenas like national security letters from the FBI under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which is distinct, I want to clarify, from PRISM. That relies on something called Section 702 of the 2008 FISA Amendments Act. But under, under, sorry, under 215 of the Patriot Act, recipients of these requests for information cannot publicly disclose to their clientele or to anyone else that they've been turning over these, these records. So... It is very difficult for these companies to talk about in public what they've been turning over to the government. Right. So, so, and there has been this, I mean, the government has obviously been very outspoken saying, look, we're not doing anything that isn't completely within our rights, completely within the law as established by in the Patriot Act. Uh, uh, the, 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 there seems to be, you know, Harry Reid is saying, look, I don't know why anybody is surprised about this. We've been doing this for years. Uh, uh, Dianne Feinstein is, is, is defending the use of uh, uh, this, this type of surveillance. Does, it, does this seem like, is there a turning point here where we need to take a look at the Patriot Act and what it allows uh, you know, obviously there have always been critics of the Patriot Act since day one. Is this a point where you feel like there needs to be real scrutiny and real oversight about what the Patriot Act allows? So a couple things. First, to be really clear, uh, PRISM is not about the Patriot Act. 
uh, the collection of millions of Americans' phone records, telephony metadata, as the as the term of art goes. Basically, your your phone number, uh, the duration of your calls, possibly the location, and so forth. That is something that uh, the NSA is justifying under Section 215, the so-called business pro records provision of the Patriot Act. That's something that already you're starting to see senators like uh, Jeff Merkley and Tom Udall say uh, needs to really be reviewed. Um, and on the broader point, um, most senators who you know aren't on the Intelligence Committee, uh, most members of Congress aren't on uh, the House version of, of the Intelligence Committee. So most of Congress is in the dark about how these programs actually operate. And what um, two senators, Ron Wyden and, and, and Mark Udall, have been warning about uh, for two years now is that uh, the administration, um, with the blessing of the FISA court, a secret surveillance court, uh, has been allowing, um, completely in private, without any public review, very broad interpretations of both the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act of 2008 that they've argued uh, allow for vastly more surveillance than most legislators thought that they were authorizing under these public laws. And they've called for the declassification of these laws, of these interpretations of these laws, because they feel that they can't responsibly legislate surveillance information. They can't responsibly legislate the surveillance rules of the road for Americans to protect Americans' privacy if in private the administration, with the blessing of a secret court, will essentially rewrite those laws. Okay, so look, I know you need to go. You're a busy guy. But what is... What's next in this story? I mean, there's more to come, right? I mean, I know you don't want to talk about there's more to, your there's reporting, more to come but, all, but, but, say, but can you, but can you, can you, can you guarantee? I mean, are we going to see some de more detail on beyond those four slides? Are there more slides to come that, that the public is going to have access I, to? I, I, just like I told you before, um, dude, I really appreciate your diligence. I respect that as a reporter. Uh, we are not going to talk about sourcing. We're not going to talk about that. I can tell you that there's going to be. Uh, more information from The Guardian about the balance between civil liberties and the online era uh, than you've seen so far. Okay, Spencer, thanks so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. That is our show. I want to thank Spencer Ackerman, Koi Vin, Nilay Patel, Nathan Seichert, and of course you, the viewer, for going on this very special, very magical journey with us. We'll be back with more On The Verge next week. And until then, there is no until then. Yeah. <laughs>